morning. Uh, well, questions, observations, remarks? What was I talking about last uh, Tuesday? How to design the compensator? How to design a compensator for a top boost DCM? So, let's try an example. Bug boost DCM. You know that the bug boost DCM, the power state, has a transfer function, a gain, that is from the relationship between V dot hat, D by D hat, that is. We have one pole, one pole somewhere at the one over. Five R C. Five R C. Well, R is the load resistance and C is the output capacitance. You have a zero due to the output capacitor ESR. So this is more or less standard. It's one over two pi ESR at C. And you have a DC gain, a low frequency gain, that is uh, given by the times square root of R over, uh, R over 2 frequency F. Okay, so you have all the numbers. I also told you that it's a good idea to include in this transfer function uh, the gain of the PWM model. PWM modulator typically is just uh, uh, simple of voltage and this voltage is the amplitude, peak to peak amplitude of the square of the social play. So here, instead of D, we put the B error, and here, instead of big A, we have B divided by B triangle. B triangle is This is what we get from uh, from the plan. This is our plan. What we want is a closed loop and loop gain that is something like this, more or less. Integrative type 1 system, so we have a high gain at low frequency, that means accuracy, DC accuracy, DC, DC precision. We have a very large phase margin, even too much, one could say, if it is a control guy, because 90 degrees of phase margin is too much. Yeah, it's true, but we have so many effects that we neglected or we, don't, we are not aware of that uh, aiming to 90 degrees, in more, more, many, many cases you get uh, something between 50 and 60 or 40 degrees of phase margin. That is uh, still okay. If you aim for 40, 45 degrees, that is the standard, in the, it's quite standard in electronics, you risk to have an unstable system because uh, you are losing. Uh, Phase here and there, you don't know, for example, the delay of the switch, uh, for example, losses, for example, the octopus, etc. So, that is our design. And our limitation, our absolute uh, limit that we cannot go beyond, is the crossover frequency. Crossover frequency must be less or equal to uh, frequency that depends on the switching. I didn't uh, tell you last time how much is this uh, uh, limit we have on the crossover frequency. And uh, this is time to introduce this, uh, this, this uh, limitation. And this limitation for voltage mode control system, that is what, are we, do, what uh, we are doing right now, is something related to the switching frequency at switch divided by a uh, factor of 12. This factor for sure is larger than point than, than 2. You cannot uh, go beyond one half of the switching frequency because you don't, have, you don't know what happens over here. You have aliasing, etc. But you have to stay quite lower than this uh, switching frequency level. The practical rules, rule for this, uh, two, uh, the rule of thumb for this uh, uh, crossover frequency is something like from the 36 up to 10, from 1.6 to 1.10 of the switching frequency. For what is small. For current mode, we will see this number. Of, this number will be a little bit small, so you can have a little bit faster system. But here, if you're switching frequencies to let's say 500 kilohertz, your uh, um, crossover frequency is between 500 kilohertz divided by 10, which is 50 kilohertz, and 500 kilohertz divided by 6, that is about uh, 83 or so kilohertz. So, so, somewhere over there. But don't go beyond 80 kilohertz or so. 
unless you are looking for troubles. If you want troubles, go, go above, but uh, it won't work very well. So, this is what we get from uh, our plan, this is what we want, and the difference between these two curves, between two, these two graphs, is what my uh, uh, compensator should provide. And uh, there is a frequency band from uh, one of the by C to this frequency, where the two graphs are parallel. And so the difference, graphic difference, between these two uh, gains is just uh, a constant value. And the constant value is just this height. That is uh, one point and uh, three fingers. Uh, so the gain will be one point and three fingers up here. Just the difference between what they want and what they get. And then here I have a zero that is going to uh, cancel to compensate this pole. And so from this point on, my gain goes up, uh, ramps up with the 20 degrees per decade slope. And from this point, I have a pole coming down like this. Well, it's not very, it's not very accurate that it's uh, drawing, but uh, that, that is the best thing. Okay? And uh, I told you that uh, this uh, transfer function, this green kind of transfer function, compensation transfer function, can be obtained with a circuit that is something like this, negative, positive, inverting, uh, inverting, and mean, RC and a second C over here. C2, R2, R1, C1. Uh, don't worry where we connect this uh, non inverting input, uh, we will define it uh, later. And this transfer function from here to here can be shaped to be that uh, green uh, transfer function. That green transfer function, what we need, has uh, three constraints that are the mid-band gain, low frequency, um, zero frequency, and four frequency. And here I have four components. <coughs> So I have to adapt uh, to find the fourth equation that I told you last time is the most difficult equation of all engineering, that is common sense equation. Common sense means uh, it could uh, be noise related, it could be cost related, it could be offset related, it could be uh, many other, uh, many other uh, constraints. And what is difficult is to choose to pick which is what is the right uh, criteria, what are the right criteria to fix these four components having only three constants. Uh, did you derive uh, the transfer function of this uh, uh, circuit, like SQ? Yes. Complicated? No? No? For sure 1 over x, uh, 1 over x because for... Uh, there is a 1 over x for sure because there is no DC feedback. You see, any feedback, any DC feedback is cut by uh, this capacitor and this capacitor. So that's an integration of frequency. After, if, if we can say that the, the, the pole and the zero are very distant, we can consider uh, in, um, for a single element uh, the pole and zero introduced. So yeah. uh, yes. for R1 sure. and C1, there is a zero. For R1 and the uh, C1, there is a there is there a is zero. A zero. Yeah. Not so sure. Yes, there is a zero, but at the infinity. And then uh, for R2 and C2, maybe there is a zero. Yes, R2 and C2 give me a zero. That's there is a pole. A pole when the um, entire impedance of C1, C2, and R2 goes to in, uh, infinity. Okay, something like this. Uh, if you work out uh, your um, analytic solution, you get a uh, not so complicated but not so simple so solution. What uh, I can give you is a simple uh, construction, frequency by frequency, and you can assume, if you want, that C2, and this is the practical case, is uh, larger than C1, but it's not required. It's, uh, I can show you that uh, we can do it uh, piece by piece. Let's suppose that our transfer function is something like this. This is what we want to get. Uh, at very low frequency, 
we had uh, we had a what's the transfer function of these uh, kind of transfer function of these? That is an integrator, and an integrator is uh, is made by made of R1 and one capacitor here at the feedback. Well, if C2 is quite larger than C1, what happens is that this integrator will be formed, this is just an integrator, will be formed by C2 and R1. So, the first C2 and R1. C2 has a reactor, so it is quite larger than R2. So, during this low frequency uh, phase, this uh, low frequency band, uh, C2 impedance is quite larger than R2, so you, we can neglect R2, and we have just this kind of a, of a circuit. When the frequency increases, and way up, in frequency, what happens? It happens that this capacitor impedance goes down. Capacitor impedance is 1 over uh, J omega C. So, if the this impedance becomes equal to the R2 impedance and even smaller, what happens is this branch, the impedance of this branch is dominated by R2. So, if you go up in frequency, this capacitor decreases its impedance and eventually it will have uh, an impedance that is equal to this one and lower. And so it means that, that from that frequency on, this branch uh, has the impedance dominated by R2. That means from this uh, given frequency on, when these two impedances are the same, uh, your circuit becomes R1 over here, and then you have this branch only, that is, uh, is made by only by uh, R2, so you have something like this. R2. And this circuit describes what happens in this part. This circuit describes what happens over here, and then if you keep going on, this capacitor is not there anymore because it's a short circuit compared to R2. But after a while, this capacitor starts to, to kick in and says, oh, and here, I, my impedance is becoming smaller than R2, and it happens at a higher frequency because I assume that C1 is quite smaller than C2. And when the impedance of C1 becomes smaller than the impedance of R2, this parallel parallel between R2 and C1 is dominated by C1. So from that frequency on, that means this frequency on, what happens is that you have a circuit like this. R1 and here C1. This is still an integrator, but at higher frequency. It's like having an integrator over here, you cut this integration uh, transfer function, you split it, and you add a constant uh, gain and in between. Okay, so far so good. Is this right? No, it's not. It's not because uh, I made some approximation, but it's a good idea to see what is going on. And uh, a couple of you suggested that if these two frequencies are far enough, uh, you can treat them uh, Separately. That's why right. you can treat them separately. They are far away anyway, quite uh, distant. And in any case, one is a whole, one is a zero, so they, inter they don't interfere each other. So far, so good. So the easy part over here, how much is this case? Minus R2 over R1. Negative R2 over R1. Yes. Then, what is. Uh, this frequency, when this frequency occurs? This frequency occurs when the impedance of C2 becomes equal to R2. So this frequency is 1 over 2 pi C2 R2. Uh, is it true or is it an approximation? Let's check. What is this? from a body block, the point of OP. Zero. That's a zero. What does a zero mean? The mean. What does zero mean? Function. function goes to zero. There is no R for a given S frequency, not J omega S frequency. 
So, what is the condition Y? Uh, well, this circuit gives me zero out. The branch with uh, R2 and C2 uh, is a short circuit. If R2 and C2 become a short circuit, I have zero out, so I have a zero. When R2 and C2 become a short circuit, we claim uh, C2 has an impedance that is opposite to R2. And if you uh, work out with this uh, condition, you find out that, that what is the frequency when you have a zero. You have to write something like dice to talk with me, to put the electronics, you probably still remember, no, they don't remember, but they, I'm sure I already told you this stuff. You write R2 is equal to negative 1 over SC2. Uh, when this equation is satisfied, R2 and uh, C2 have an opposite impedance, Add the two opposite numbers, you get zero. That means that your feedback range is a short circuit, and if it is a short circuit, uh, nothing comes out from the uh, from the circuit, from the output of this uh, amplify, amplifying stage. So when these two have opposite impedance, they sum up to zero, and you have a short, you have a zero transmission. Zero, zero means nothing uh, comes out, and so. You have to find S, and S is equal to negative 1 over C2 of 2, and instead of a, um, there's something strange. There is no J in this expression. This is S0. This 0 is, if you look at the S plane, at the complex plane of the S uh, domain uh, is zero, so here is a left hand side, uh, left F plane zero, and it's real. This is the reason for this negative sign. Negative sign means left F plane. But how is it possible that we get a zero that is over here, and we get the same zero at this frequency? I mean, here we are talking about uh, a zero, and the zero should have a zero output. Uh, and if the output is zero, in dp, zero is down over here. How do you start? It's the module. So, yeah, it's absolute value, magnitude. Yeah. And maybe we are cutting the S function uh, according to the mean. Because we are visiting the S plane only along the J omega axis. We are visiting, when we draw our body plot, this axis, actually this half axis, from our origin up to infinity frequency. And zero is over here. So we don't hit the zero. We don't pass through the zero. We just see on the frequency domain, on this axis, what is the effect of a zero lying on this uh, real position. So when we say the zero is at that frequency, it's not strictly precisely true because the zero is over here, so real axis. And we are just walking along the uh, imaginary axis. But the effect that this zero gives me on the imaginary axis is that uh, you have uh, an increase of uh, slope by 20 degrees per decade. And this is exactly at 1 over 2 pi c2 r That is exactly. Then, what else? Here, the toll is given by the fact that this capacitance C1 has an impedance that becomes comparable to uh, R2. So, if these two impedances become the same, C1 starts to dominate the parallel between C1 and R2, and that again start to go, to go down. So we have a pole, and this pole has a frequency that is obviously 1 over 2 pi C1 R2. And this is Fp. Fp, Fz, Fc, Fp, Fc, and gain are the three equations we can get from this circuit. Four components, three equations. Is it this uh, um, 
expression right? No, that's not right. We have to make a constraint for the resistance or not uh, for the dimensions. So, for example, R2 has to be higher than R1. R2 and R1, the relationship between R2 and R1 is given by this case. Uh, what, what I would like to check is this equation is right or not. It's exact or not. It's okay. For, uh, from an engineering point of view, this is okay. But is it strictly precise or is it, is it just an approximation? Approximation. <coughs> we are not considering C2 for the... We are not considering C2, but we are looking only for one pole. And that, that's uh, tricky. Have an idea of that. R1. And you look at the impedance you see on the feedback branch, just the impedance in from here. If this opacity uh, is ideal, this is ideal of that. Infinity. 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 Nothing else is important for an, for an ideal of that. Uh, many textbooks you find that uh, an ideal of amp has infinite input impedance. Who cares? It's not true, it's not needed. It has an infinite uh, a zero output impedance. It's not important. Who cares? It's not as long as you have infinite uh, gain, that's enough. Okay, if you look at the impedance between these two uh, nodes, you get that this V goes to infinity. So, your feedback network is just something like this. And from here to here, there is not no impedance is connected. So you see, if the, this is uh, connected between a two infinite, uh, infinite nodes. What you have is these two capacitors are in series. They behave like one capacitor, and these only equivalent capacitance sees these resistance. So this pole frequency. It's not the 1 over 2 pi C1 R2. There is also C2, and it, and it is 1 over 2 pi C1 series with C2 R2. But I told you, in many cases, C2 is uh, larger, at least by like 2 or 3 orders of magnitude, than C1. So when you put a small capacitor and a large capacitor in series, the total capacitance is basically equal to the small capacitance. So if you have, let's say, 1 nanofarads and 100 nanofarads, when you put them in series, the total capacitance is about 1 nanofarad. Less than 90 picofarads, who cares? And so, here, this is an approximation because this is not C1. This should be C1 times C2 divided by C1 plus C2. But it's uh, is, uh, good enough because these two, 0 and 4, are uh, far apart. At least two orders of magnitude to the Okay, so that's good. And what about the fourth equation that we need to determine the last, uh, the last uh, component? What could be offset? Eh, it's not big. Offset here is not uh, a very big deal. The other one could be somebody told me last time noise. What noise? Who said the noise on Tuesday? What noise? You say the, something like a uh, whisper of intonicity. I am deaf. Speak loud. You said something like a uh, uh, like, uh, uh, whisper in a disco. Oh, oh, whispering uh, in a disco. Okay. Uh, noise, there are two, when you say noise, there are two possible interpretations of this word. Well, one is, noise is the noise generated by this resistance R1, normal noise, uh, you have the noise generated by uh, the diesel band, etc. That is what uh, low noise uh, electronic designers are worried about. This uh, thermal noise is the intrinsic noise of this band. That's not a big deal. For in our system, our system is so, has so much noise around, noise in the, uh, meaning interferences. <coughs> All your service is interfering in your system. That, you don't see for sure the microwaves or nanowaves of the thermal noise coming out from this resistance. 
So what is important is the, the interference that you get is the disturbances that you get from the external circuit to this stuff. If you have a circuit and you want to make it uh, hard to be disturbed, uh, difficult to be disturbed, uh, you don't want uh, it to get uh, uh, noise from the circuit around, uh, the technique you use, uh, besides using uh, shields, etc., is make your circuit with uh, low capacity, uh, low uh, impedances, because uh, External noise is coupled to this circuit via parasitic capacitors. You have a wire over here going up and down by 200, uh, 200 volts very fast. Well, there is a parasitic capacitor between this wire which is over here and this circuit. So if you don't want to inject too much noise, you have to keep these impedances as low as practical. And uh, from this uh, point of view, what I can suggest you as uh, a first uh, trial, and remember that design is never uh, I apply the formula and I go, I apply the equation and go from A to B. I try to go from A to B, sometimes I get, I take a wrong path, so I have to say, oops, wrong path, I have to back up and go into another direction. <laughs> so, my suggestion is uh, let's start to, to uh, impose the value of C1. C1 is my choice, is the degree of freedom that I use to start my design. And C1 is a, as an order of magnitude included in the range. Uh, I don't want to give you numbers because uh, otherwise you stick in these numbers and you will remember C1 must have this uh, value. No, it's not true. C1 can have a very quite broad range of uh, values. But you cannot have C1 too small, because if it is too small, if impedance is high and you get the noise uh, capacity coupled to your system. So, the minimum for C1 should be... It's really hard to, to say it out, because I don't want to say it out. But I have to. Let's say 68 picofarads. If you don't like 68, you prefer uh, 82, 100 <coughs> It's okay, but don't go, don't go below 50 picofarads. And I don't like to 68 picofarads. I never used in my design this uh, small value. Up to, well, it depends on what you are designing, but uh, let's say no idea. 680 picofarads. But in this case, I am designing a <coughs> circuit that has uh, for C1. Uh, as a one and a half. Not too small, otherwise you get parasitic interferences, uh, you get uh, capacity coupled noise into your circuit. Not too large, because a large capacitor is long to be charged and discharged. If your uh, op amp goes up from linear for any reason, if it uh, bangs against the stops of the output voltage, saturates positive or negative. And it has to come out from saturation, it takes more time. The larger are these uh, capacitances, all, the, all of them, the longer is the time to get to come out from a uh, saturation condition. And you don't want, if your system saturates, uh, to take a lot of time to come out from, uh, from uh, the saturation. Otherwise, what what this would be real. So that's somewhere, something over there. And remember, the design is never going from A to B straight, straight line, uh, line. You go from A to B, trying a path, and if you find out that your path is not right, back up and get to another path. If you decide, I put here 100 picofarads, for example, and you discover that the other uh, numbers are weird, are too large, or too small, you back up and you start with a different uh, level. Design is not a uh, deterministic uh, uh, procedure, deterministic habit. You have to try, check, come back, change your mind, uh, pick a different value, and so on. This is the reason why design is more difficult than analysis. Analysis, you have your circuit, circuit you write down the equations, and you get the solution. Design is uh, quite uh, hard. So, what we have, pick uh, determine C1, we can go on because from C1 you can find R2, C1 using uh, uh, that equation, so the full frequency, you determine R2, 
from R2 using the zero frequency, you determine C2, and from R2 with the gain, you determine R1, and your system is almost solved. Almost. There is one extra component we have to design. Okay? So that's good? Let's try an example. Let's suppose we say our bulk boost converter we want to uh, compensate has uh, is the is the bulk boost I gave you as a homework, uh, second homework, has let's say uh, inductance that is uh, 22 microfarads, that is my design. Uh, output capacitance C now that is 470 microfarads. We have uh, output current that goes from zero up to 0.5 amps. An output voltage that is negative 12 volts, or 12 volts. Is, uh, we are working with magnets right here, so the negative sign is not so important. Uh, switching frequency is let's say 200 kilohertz. So it's a 6 watt uh, converter. We know that the shape of our DCM bug boost is something like this. I forgot to tell you that the input voltage goes from 9 volts up to 18 volts. So, <coughs> let's start, start to put numbers on these class of function. What's the worst case from the stability point of view? What's the worst case that gives me the highest gain in this region? That means that makes my uh, crossover frequency uh, <coughs> maximum value. Yes, are very high. V max. V max, sure. V in max. And minimum? Minimum low. Uh, what do you mean with minimum load? Minimum output power or minimum load resistance? Uh, no. <coughs> Minimum load resistance, maximum output power. So, R load minimum. And V max is equal to 18 watt. Give me a number, always, 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 always. Give me also the unit, otherwise it's meaningless can cost you money just for getting these units. A lot of money. Hundreds of millions of dollars. There was a space probe that crashed on Mars planet because of an error in the unit. It was the Mars Explorer. It was supposed to uh, enter in orbit around Mars. And you one of the uh, uh, Flight correction during the, the path uh, going from the Earth to Mars. Uh, one group <coughs> evaluated this uh, correction in terms of uh, thrust and the duration of thrust using in, uh, standard units. The other uh, team understood that the one that had to actually send the, to, to the probe, the control, the command to, to fire the engine, uh, understood that this uh, correction in terms of trust and time in uh, metric, metric units. So one was talking about uh, uh, pounds of trust and the other one understood the newtons. And guess what? The problem came out just a little bit too late and dropped down uh, into the Mars atmosphere. It's a tiny, very tiny atmosphere but it's enough uh, to, to crash uh, to destroy a problem. So, Unit, always, always, always. Our, our L-bin 
A is uh, 12 volts divided by 25 amps. Like this. 24 volts. And now let's start to put numbers. What is what this? Uh, get your calculator on your head, on your brain, and uh, on your slide tool. Do you know what the slide tool is? What the slide tool is? Regular regular color tone. Show 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 me see see it. No, it's the regular color tone. It's German is a lot. Regular color tone in French. Let's start to put numbers. What is it? Total frequency in the worst case uh, stability wise. This is 1 over pi RC. You know, R, these are the minimum load resistance. And uh, you know, C, 470 microfarad. So, 1 over pi RC is equal to. No one with the calculator. Come on, engineers must have a break. Oh, it's four
you have an idea what is the ESR of your electrolytic capacitor. I mean, what is the zero frequency of your electrolytic capacitor. Because uh, during your uh, written exam, when you have to find out what is a zero, what you do actually is uh, you know what is the ESR, what the ESR, ESR you needed to uh, control the output ripple, <laughs> and uh, from this ESR you will get an estimation, an estimate, a rough estimate of your capacitance value. Then you pick a normalized capacitor value, and you can do anything better in the, your uh, written exam because you can have the catalog and the time to browse the catalogs. Uh, so you will give me an ESR and uh, capacitors. Yes, now you need what you need. Uh, you know what you need. This capacity is just an estimation, an estimate of this uh, value. And uh, this zero, you don't have to recalculate it back. If you pick the, if you say, let's assume that my capacitor has an ESR of 3 kilohertz or 4, 4 kilohertz, this will be your ESR, your zero frequency. Depends on what kind of a capacitor you choose. If you want to be, let's say, conservative, you say 2, 3 kilohertz. If you are very optimistic, you will hope to find a very good capacitor that can tell me 5, 8 kilohertz. If you go for a central capacitor, you can tell me 20 kilohertz or so. Depends on whatever you choose for your system. Let's suppose we get a normal standard. Not so bad, but not neither so good. The electric capacitor, this zero could be a 3, 4 kilohertz, something like this. Let's call it 3 kilohertz. And uh, just observe the distance of this zero, this pole and this zero is about uh, two decades. So they are far apart. Is this, this frequency fixed? Yes, more or less. Is this frequency accurate? <coughs> Absolutely not because it depends on the parasitic element of your capacitor. So, same uh, capacitor, mm -hmm. uh, same kind of capacitor, same batch, can have a, a zero at 3 kilohertz, another one can be 3.5 kilohertz. So if you change the brand, if you change the model, the zero frequency can change the drastically. <coughs> Is this frequency precise over there, exactly there, 28 hertz? No, it depends on load. If the load decreases, this goes to the left. Gain. How much is the gain? Low frequency gain. B A, not no B, times the square root of R or over 2 switching frequency F. Punch your calculator softly. Don't hit Here you have to use the minimum load resistance and here the maximum input load. Mm -hmm. Still doing the calculations just to find the 30 watts or so. How much is it? 50? I like it better. Come on, you can do it in your head. Matter man. Use it. Two times twenty-two is forty-four. Forty-four times two hundred. No, it's too difficult. Two hundred. It's too large. Good number. Sir. Small integer and positive. If you have to drop one of these three requirements, you can drop an integer, but the small and positive is important. So instead of two hundred here, just put here point two mega. So, 44 times 0.2 is like 44 times 2 divided by 10. 44 times 2 is 88 divided by 10, 10 is 8.8. So, this is 8.8, then we have mega, 
because I like small numbers. I don't have large like, number accumulator in my head. I can work up to uh, maybe 100 or so, but after three digits uh, I don't see numbers anymore. So, uh, mega times micro is one. Henry times hertz is ohms. So this is 8.8 ohms, and this is 24 ohms. So 24 divided by 8, because they don't know how to divide by 8.8, it's too difficult. But 24 divided by 8 is 50. It's easy. 4 is 3. 3. But this is not 8. This is 10% more than 8, so the result will be 10% less than 3. Uh, less than 3, yes. 10% less than 3 is... 2.7. Oh, you already did. 2.7 ohms. So you have to take the square root of 2.7. How much is the square root of 2.7? About 3.7. You, everybody knows the square root of 3. 1.73. Square root of 3 is 1.7. 1.73. If you want to go this way, there is another way to, the, to evaluate this square root. 1.7, uh, sorry, square root of uh, 3 is 1.7. But we don't have the square root of uh, 3. We have the square root of uh, 2.7. 2.7 is 10% less than 3. So the result will be 5% because the the exponent here is one and a half, it will be 5% less than 1.7. 1.73 divided by 5, uh, 5 percent of 1.73 is 100, about 6. Mm -hmm. ah, please observe, I, don't, I am not uh, evaluating 1.73. I don't like the decimal numbers. 173, 5 percent of 173 means 173 divided by 20. And it means 180 divided by 20, it means 6. So the result will be 173 minus 6, that is 167. And that means this square root will be 1.67. What? Yep, this is the measurements. Can you, can you just check, double check how much is this square root? One point sixty four instead of one point sixty seven. Close enough. I am not in my best shape to do mental math, but it's close enough. One point sixty seven times eighteen. That is easy. Come on. Eighteen times sixteen is like seventeen times seventeen, more or less. A little bit uh, less, but not so much. So. 117 times 1.7 times 1.7 is about 3. <coughs> a little bit less because it's 1.73. Uh, the square gives you more. Three. But this is a little bit more light. So 30 is a good uh, approximation. 39.7. That means 1% of error. If you make an error that is more than 5% in this kind of calculation, I see.